from the prophecies and revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden. At the end, a prayer for the intercession of St. Bridget of Sweden. When Lady Bridget, the Bride of Christ, was in Rome and was once absorbed in prayer, she began to think about the virgin birth and about the very great goodness of God who willed to choose such a very pure mother for himself. And her heart then became so greatly inflamed with love for the virgin that she said within herself, O oh my lady, queen of heaven, my heart so rejoices over the fact that the Most High God forechose you, as his mother and deigned to confer upon you so great a dignity, that I would rather choose for myself eternal excruciation in hell, than that you should lack one smallest point of this surpassing glory, or of your heavenly dignity. And so, inebriated with the sweetness of love, she was above herself, alienated from her senses and suspended in an ecstasy of mental contemplation. The Virgin appeared then to her and said to her, Be attentive, O daughter, I am the Queen of Heaven. Because you love me with a love so immense, I therefore announce to you that you will go on a pilgrimage to the holy city of Jerusalem at the time when it pleases my son. From there you will go to Bethlehem, and there I shall show you, at the very spot, the whole manner in which I gave birth to that same son of mine, Jesus Christ, for so it has pleased him. While Lady Bridget, the Bride of Christ, was in Rome, in the church called St. Mary Major, on the Feast of the Purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary, she was caught up into a spiritual vision, and saw that in heaven, as it were, all things were being prepared for a great feast. And then she saw, as it were, a temple of wondrous beauty, and there too was that venerable and just old man, Simeon, ready to receive the child Jesus in his arms with supreme longing and gladness. She also saw the Blessed Virgin most honorably enter, carrying her young son to offer him in the temple according to the law of the Lord. And then she saw a countless multitude of angels and of the various ranks of the saintly men of God and of his saintly virgins and ladies, all going before the Blessed Virgin Mother of God and surrounding her with all joy and devotion. Before her an angel carried a long, very broad, and bloody sword which signified those very great sorrows which Mary suffered at the death of her most loving son, and which were prefigured by that sword which the just man Simeon prophesied would pierce her soul. And while all the heavenly court exulted, this was said to the bride, See with what great honor and glory the Queen of Heaven is, on this feast, recompensed for the sword of sorrows which she endured at the passion of her beloved son. And then this vision disappeared. On the feast of St. Francis in his church in Trastevere in Rome, St. Francis appeared to the same Bride of Christ and said to her, Come into my chamber to eat and to drink with me. When she heard this, she at once prepared for a journey in order to visit him in Assisi. After she had stayed there five days, she decided to return to Rome and entered the church to recommend herself and her loved ones to St. Francis. He then appeared to her and said, Welcome. For I invited you into my chamber to eat and to drink with me. Know now that this building is not the chamber that I mentioned to you. No, my chamber is true obedience, to which I always so held that I never endured to be without an instructor. For I continually had with me a priest whose every instruction I humbly obeyed, and this was my chamber. Therefore do likewise, for this is pleasing to God. My food, however, whereby I was refreshed with delight, was the fact that I most willingly drew my neighbors away from the vanities of worldly life to serve God with the whole of their hearts, and I then swallowed that joy as if it were the sweetest morsels. My drink, however, was that joy I had while I saw some whom I had converted loving God, devoting themselves with all their strength to prayer and contemplation, teaching others to live good lives, and imitating true poverty. Behold, daughter, that drink so gladdened my soul that, for me, all things in the world lost their taste. Enter therefore, into this chamber of mine, and eat this, my food, and drink this drink with me. Drink it so that you may be refreshed with God eternally. To a person who was wide awake and at prayer, it seemed as if her heart were on fire with divine charity, and entirely full of spiritual joy so that her body itself seemed to fail in its strength. She then heard a voice that said to her, I am the Creator and Redeemer of all. Know therefore that such a joy, as you now feel in your soul, is a treasure of mine. For it is written that the Spirit breathes where he will, and you hear his voice, but you know not whence he comes or whither he goes. This treasure I bestow on my friends in many ways and by many means and through many gifts. 
However, I wish to tell you about another treasure, which is not yet in heaven but is with you on earth. This treasure is the relics and bodies of my friends. For, in truth, whether they are fresh or moldering, whether they have turned into dust and ashes or not, the bodies of my saints are most certainly my treasure. But you may ask, since scripture says, where your treasure is, there your heart is, how then is my heart with that treasure, namely, with the relics of the saints? I answer you, my heart's supreme delight is to bestow according to their will, their faith, and the toils of their journey everlasting rewards on all those who visit the places and honor the relics of my saints, namely, of those who had been glorified by miracles and canonized by the supreme pontiffs. Thus my heart is with my treasure. Therefore, I want you to know for certain that in this place is my most choice treasure, namely, the relics of my Apostle Thomas, which are not found elsewhere in such quantity as they are on this altar, where they are unspoiled and undivided. For when that city where my Apostle's body was first buried was destroyed, then with my permission this treasure was translated by certain of my friends to this city and was placed on this altar. But now it lies here as if concealed, for before the Apostle's body came here, the princes of this land were of the disposition described in the scriptures. They have mouths and will not speak. They have eyes and will not see. They have ears and will not hear. They have hands and will not touch. They have feet and will not walk, etc. How could such people then, with such an attitude toward me, their God, be able to pay due honor to such a treasure? Therefore, anyone who loves me and my friends above all, and who would rather die than offend me in the least, and who also has the will and the authority to honor me and to instruct others, such a one, whoever it be, will exalt and honor my treasure, namely, the relics of this my apostle whom I chose and forechose. Therefore, it should be said and preached for very certain that, just as the bodies of the apostles Peter and Paul are in Rome, the relics of St. Thomas, my apostle, are in Ortona. The bride, however, answered and said, O Lord, did not the princes of this kingdom have churches built, and did they not practice great almsgiving? The Lord said to her, They have done many things and have offered me much money to appease me. Yet the alms of many of them were to me less pleasing and acceptable because of the marriages that they had contracted contrary to the statutes of the Holy Fathers. And even though those marriages that the supreme pontiffs permitted were ratified and to be upheld, nevertheless the will of those people was corrupt, and was striving against the statutes of the church. Therefore, at my divine judgment, this must be examined and judged. Addition. When the lady had gone to Ortona, it happened that she and her companions had to spend a whole night under God's open sky, in the cold, and in a heavy rain. Then toward dawn, Christ said to her, For three reasons, tribulation comes to human beings, either for greater humility as when King David was troubled or for greater fear and caution as when Sarah, Abraham's wife, was taken away by the king, or for a human being's greater consolation and honor. And so it has happened to you. For I gave those who met you the impulse to proceed no farther that day. But you would not believe them, and so you suffered as you have. Therefore go now into the city, and my servant Thomas will give you what you desire. Item concerning the same thing. Christ appeared in Ortona and said, I told you earlier that St. Thomas, my apostle, was my treasure. This is certainly true. For Thomas himself is truly a light of the world. But human beings love darkness more than light. Then St. Thomas also appeared and said, I will give to you a treasure that you have long since desired. And in the same moment, a tiny splinter of a bone of blessed Thomas came forth from the very case of St. Thomas's relics without anyone's touch. The lady received it with joy and reverently saved it. To Almighty God, from whom all good things proceed, be praise and honor, especially for these things that he has done for you in the time of your youth. Of his grace one must ask that the love you have for him may increase in you daily even until death. A mighty and magnificent king constructed a house, in which he placed his beloved daughter, assigning her to the custody of a man and saying this, my daughter has mortal enemies and therefore you must guard her with all care. There are four things that you must beware with diligent premeditation and constant concern. First, that no one undermine the foundation of the house. Second, that no one climb over the top of the outer walls. Third, that no one breach the walls of the house. Fourth, that no enemy enter through the gates. 
My Lord, this parable that I write for you out of divine charity God, the searcher of all hearts being my witness must be understood spiritually. Therefore, by the house I mean your body, which the King of heaven formed out of the earth. By the King's daughter I mean your soul, created by the power of the Most High and placed in your heart. By the guardian I mean human reason, which will guard your soul according to the will of the Eternal King. By the foundation I mean a good, firm, and stable will. For on it must be built all good works, by which the soul is best defended. Therefore, since your will is such that you wish to live for nothing else but to follow God's will, showing Him by word and deed all the honor you can, and also serving Him with your body and your goods and all your strength, as long as you live, in order that you may be able to commend your soul, preserved from all impurity of the flesh, to its Creator then, oh how vigilantly must you guard this foundation, your will, by means of the guardian, your reason, so that no one may be able to undermine it with his siege engines to the soul's harm. By those who strive to undermine this type of foundation I mean those who speak to you thus and say, My lord, be a layman and take to yourself a charming, noble, and wealthy wife so that you may rejoice in your offspring and heirs and no be weighed down by the tribulation of the flesh. And others perhaps reply in this manner, If you want to become a cleric, then also learn the liberal arts, to the end that you may be called master while procuring for yourself, by prayers or gifts, as much as you can of the goods and revenues of the church. Then you will have worldly honor for your knowledge, and by your worldly friends and your many servants, you will be glorified for the abundance of your riches. Behold, if perhaps anyone should offer you such persuasion, immediately make the guardian, answer him and say that you would be willing to endure all the tribulation of the flesh rather than lose your chastity. Answer also that you want to acquire knowledge and the arts for the honor of God and the defense of the Catholic faith, for the strengthening of good people and for the correction of the erring and of all who need your advice and teaching, and say that you do not wish to desire anything in this life beyond sustenance for your body and for the household truly necessary to you and not overly enlarged for the sake of vainglory. Say also that, if perchance divine providence were to confer on you some added dignity, you desire to order all things wisely for the benefit of your neighbor and for the honor of God. And so indeed the guardian will be able to expel those who are exerting themselves to undermine the foundation, your goodwill. Reason must also constantly and diligently beware lest anyone climb over the top of the walls. By this top of the walls I mean charity, which is more sublime than all the virtues. Know therefore most certainly that the devil desires nothing more than to leap over that wall. And so he incessantly tries as much as he can that mundane charity and carnal love may surpass divine charity. Wherefore, my Lord, as often as worldly love attempts to advance itself in your heart in preference to divine charity, immediately send the guardian out to meet it with the commandments of God and saying that you would rather endure death in soul and body than live to such an end that you would, by word or deed, provoke a God so kind, and indeed, that you would not in any way spare your own life, your goods or possessions, or the favorable opinions of your relatives and friends provided that. You might be able to please God alone in every respect and honor Him in all things, and that you choose to submit voluntarily to all tribulations rather than cause any harm, scandal, or trouble to any of your neighbors whether higher or lower than yourself and that, in accord with the precept of the Lord, you wish instead to love all your neighbors thoroughly and in a brotherly way. And if you do this, my Lord, you are proved to love God more than yourself, and your neighbor as yourself. Then, therefore, the guardian can rest securely because no rival of your soul is able to climb over the top of the walls. By the house walls, in truth, I mean four delights of the heavenly court, which a human being ought to long for interiorly with attentive meditation. The first is a fervent longing in the heart to see God himself in his eternal glory and those unfailing riches that are never taken away from one who has acquired them. The second is an incessant wish to hear those sweet-sounding voices of the angels in which, without tiring and without end, they praise God and unceasingly adore Him. The third is a wholehearted and fervently longing desire eternally to praise God even as the very angels do. The fourth is longing to possess the everlasting consolations of the angels and of the holy souls in heaven. Hence it is to be noted that, just as one who is inside a house is always surrounded by walls wherever one turns, so it is with everyone who, day and night, with supreme longing, 
desires those four things namely, to see God in His glory, to hear the angels praising God, to praise God together with them, and to possess their consolations. Truly, wherever such a one turns or whatever work he is intent upon, he is then always preserved unharmed inside firm walls so that, as a result, by dwelling among the very angels in this life, he may be said to enjoy the company of God. Oh how much, my Lord, your enemy longs to dig through walls of this sort, and to take such inner delights away from the heart, and to introduce and entangle into your desire others contrary to them, which could gravely harm your soul. On which account, the guardian, must have diligent precaution about the two ways by which the enemy usually comes. The first way is the hearing, the second sight. He comes indeed through the hearing when he introduces into the heart the delights of secular songs and of various sweet-sounding instruments, of useless tales and of narrations of the praises of one's own person. The more these things raise one up through pride in oneself, the more distantly one is separated from the humble Christ. Therefore the guardian must resist such delight and say this, just as the devil has hatred for all the humility that the Holy Spirit breathes into the hearts of human beings. So I, by the working of God's help, will have hatred for all the pomp and worldly pride that the evil spirit, with his pestilent inflammation, pours into hearts, and it shall be to me as hateful as the stench of rotten corpses, which immediately suffocates those who catch it in their nostrils. Through sight also the enemy is accustomed to come, as if by a second way, to dig through the aforementioned house walls, and he brings with him many tools, namely, all sorts of metals wrought into various objects and forms, precious stones, prestigious clothing, lordly palaces, castles, estates, ponds, forests, vineyards, and all other sorts of costly and lucrative things. For if all these things are fervently desired, they are a proven means of dissipating the aforementioned house walls, the heavenly delights. Therefore the guardian must run out quickly, before such things come into the heart's delight and love, and must say, if I shall have in my power any of the possessions of this sort, I will lay it away in that chest where thieves or moth are not feared, and with divine grace helping me, I will not offend my God through coveting others' possessions, nor through ambition for the things of others. Will I separate myself in any way from the company of those who serve Christ? By the gates of the said house I mean, in fact, all the body's needs, which indeed the body cannot decline, namely, eating, drinking, sleep, wakefulness, and even occasional distresses and joys. Therefore the guardian must stand by these gates, the body's needs, with concern and with divine fear, must resist enemies wisely and persistently lest they enter toward the soul. Therefore, just as in taking food and drink one must beware lest the enemy enter through overindulgence, which makes the soul slothful in serving God, so too one must beware lest the foe gain entrance through excessive abstinence which makes the body weak in doing all things. Let the guardian also take note lest either when you are alone with your household or when guests arrive, for the sake of worldly honor and the favorable opinion of human beings, there be an uninterrupted succession of too many courses. But out of divine charity, treat each one well while excluding a multiplicity of foods and also extravagant delicacies. Next, the guardian must with vigilance and attention consider the fact that just as food and drink must be moderated, so too must sleep be moderated with fear in such a way that the body may be nimble and in better order for accomplishing all the honor of God so that every waking moment may be usefully spent on the divine offices and on honest labors, with all the heaviness of sleep far removed. Moreover, at the approach of any distress or rancor, the guardian, accompanied by his companion, namely, fear of God, must swiftly run forth lest, through anger or impatience, it happened that you forfeit divine grace and gravely provoke God against yourself. What is more, when some consolation or joy fills your heart, let the guardian imprint the heart more deeply with the fear of God which, with the help of the grace of Jesus Christ, will moderate that consolation or joy in a way that will be of more use to you. Addition. When Lady Bridget was in Naples, there were revealed to her the innermost secrets of the heart of Elzir later a cardinal and certain wonderful things that were going to happen to him. When he heard these things, he was stunned, and he changed for the better. While Lady Bridget was living continuously in Rome, she was one day at prayer and her mind was lifted up. Christ then appeared to her and spoke to her, saying this, 
Prepare yourselves now to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to visit my sepulchre and the other holy places that are to be found there. You will leave Rome when I tell you. Honor and thanks be given to Almighty God and to the Blessed Virgin Mary, His most worthy mother. It seemed to me, unworthy person that I am, that while I was absorbed in prayer, the Mother of God spoke to me, a sinner, these following words, Say to my friend the friar, who through you sent his supplication to me, that it is the true faith and the perfect truth that if a person, at the devil's instigation, had committed every sin against God and then, with true contrition and the purpose of amendment, truly repented these sins and humbly, with burning love, asked God for mercy, there is no doubt that the kind and merciful God himself would immediately be as ready to receive that person back into his grace with great joy and happiness as would be a loving father who saw returning to him his only, dearly beloved son, now freed from a great scandal and a most shameful death. Yes, much more willingly than any fleshly father, the loving God himself forgives his servants all their sins if they assiduously repent and humbly ask him for mercy and they fear to go on committing sins, and, with all the longing of their hearts, desire God's friendship above all things. Therefore say to that same friar, on my behalf, that because of his good will and my prayer, God in his goodness has already forgiven him all the sins that he ever committed in all the days of his life. Tell him also that because of my prayer the love that he has for God will always increase in him right up to his death, and will in no way diminish. Likewise, say to him that it pleases God my son that he stay in Rome, preaching, giving good advice to those who ask, hearing confessions, and imposing salutary penances, unless his superior should send him sometimes out of the city for some lawful necessity. For their transgressions, the same friar should charitably reprove his other brothers with good words with salutary teachings, and when he might be able to correct them, even with just rebukes, to the end that they may keep the rule and humbly amend their lives. Furthermore, I now make known to him that his masses and his reading and his prayers are acceptable and pleasing to God, and therefore tell him that, just as he guards himself against any excess in food and drink and sleep, so he must diligently guard himself against too much abstinence in order that he may not suffer any faintness in performing divine labors and services. Also, he is not to have an overabundance of clothing but only necessary things, according to the rule of St. Francis, so that pride and cupidity may not ensue, for the less costly and valuable his clothes have been, the more lavish shall be his reward. And let him humbly obey all of his superior's instructions that are not contrary to God and that the friar's own ability permits him to perform. Tell him also, on my behalf, what he will answer to those who say that the Pope is not the true Pope and that it is not the true body of Jesus Christ my Son that the priests confect on the altar. He should answer those heretics in this way, You have turned the backs of your heads to God, and thus you do not see him. Turn therefore to him your faces, and then you will be able to see him. For it is the true and Catholic faith that a Pope who is without heresy is no matter how stained he be with other sins never so wicked as a result of these sins and his other bad deeds that there would not always be in him full authority and complete power to bind and loose souls. He possesses this authority through blessed Peter and has acquired it from God. For before Pope John, there were many supreme pontiffs who are now in hell. Nevertheless, the just and reasonable judgments that they made in the world are standing and approved in God's sight. For a similar reason, I also say that all those priests who are not heretical although otherwise full of many other sins are true priests and truly confect the body of Christ my Son and that truly they touch God in their hands on the altar and administer the other sacraments even though, because of their sins and evil deeds, they are unworthy of heavenly glory in God's sight. Say to my friend the friar that it is not licit for you to know whether the soul of Pope John XXI is in hell or in heaven. Nor indeed is it licit for you to know anything about the sins that the same Pope took with him when, after his death, he came before God's judgment. But tell the same friar that those decretals that the same Pope John made or established concerning Christ's private property contain no error in the Catholic faith nor any heresy. I, indeed, who gave birth to the true God himself, bear witness to the fact that the same Jesus Christ, my Son, had one personal possession and that he alone possessed it. This was that tunic that I made with my own hands. And the prophet witnesses to this fact, saying in the person of my Son, 
over my garment, they cast lots. Behold and be attentive to the fact that he did not say our garment but my garment. Know too that, as often as I dressed him in that tunic for the use of his most holy body, my eyes then filled at once with tears and my whole heart was wrung with trouble and grief and was afflicted with intense bitterness. For I well knew the manner in which that tunic would in future be separated from my son, namely, at the time of his passion when, naked and innocent, he would be crucified by the Jews. And this tunic was that garment over which his crucifiers cast lots. No one had that same tunic while he lived, but only he alone. Know too that all those who say that the Pope is not the true Pope and that the priests are not true priests or rightly ordained and that what is consecrated by the priests in the celebration of Masses is not the true body of my blessed Son, yes, all those who assert such errors are puffed up with the spirit of the devil in hell. For truly these same heretics have committed such serious acts of malice and frightful sins against God that, because of their very great demerits, they are damnably filled with diabolic wickedness, and through their heresy, they are cut off and cast out from the number of the whole flock of Christianity in the just judgment of the Divine Majesty. Just as Judas was shut out and cut off from the sacred number of the apostles because of his wicked demerits, for he betrayed Christ my Son. Know that even so, all those who want to amend their lives will obtain mercy from God. The Son of God speaks to bless Bridget his bride and says, Go now and depart from Rome for Jerusalem. Why do you plead your age? I am the creator of nature. I can weaken or strengthen nature as it pleases me. I will be with you. I will direct your way. I will guide you and lead you back to Rome, and I will procure for you everything necessary, more adequately than you have ever had before. Prayer for the Intercession of St. Bridget of Sweden St. Bridget, Bride of Christ, your life was centered around honoring the wounds of Jesus. Intercede before our wounded Lord and ask Him to forgive us for the times when we failed to recognize His presence, or accept His help and the times when we sinned against Him, causing increased pain. Saint Bridget, implored Jesus in His mercy to bestow upon us a reverence and devotion to His sacred wounds. Help us to carry our crosses with love. Please tell Jesus that we love Him and thank Him for the pain and humiliation He endured for our sake. Saint Bridget, we humbly ask you to lay our petitions at the feet of the risen Jesus where we know you will be warmly received. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Saint Bridget of Sweden, pray for us.